you squeeze Chucha Waskett, Pamela Barnes. Um, it's my honor today to formally welcome you to the uh, Seals territory. And so before I do that, I want to share with you a little bit about what our lands mean to us. In this part of Turtle Island, which is how we refer to North America, the sharing of our lands with peoples from other places is fairly recent. It's about 200 years. Where other parts of Turtle Island, that history goes back 500 years, 1,000 years, depending on where you're speaking of. But here it's fairly recent. And with those um, coming together of different uh, peoples from different places, um, came some new ideas about human relationship to the land and that are very different from our traditional um, viewpoint about our relationship to the lands. And so one of those concepts is the idea of ownership, um, human ownership of land. And we as Sioux people see ourselves more of borrowing these lands from our great, 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 great grandchildren. We look at things in seven generations. Um, and there's a very big difference between those two ideas. So if I own this necklace, I can sell it, I can trade it, I can give it away. It's mine. I can do what I want. There's an, um, it's up to me how I choose to care for it. I can take great care or I can toss it aside. Again, it's mine. I can do what I want with it. If I borrow this necklace, everything changes in those relationships. I cannot sell it. I cannot trade it. I cannot give it away. And there's an expectation that I take the very best care possible. And when I leave it or return it, that at least it's in the same condition I found it in, and if at all possible, in better. Um, so those ideas are very different. And it's with that understanding of our understanding of our relationship to these lands that we first welcomed people to the traditional unceded territory of the Seals people. And so it's with that understanding that today I welcome you to the traditional unceded and currently occupied territory of the Seals people with the gentle reminder that none of us, including ourselves as Seals people, are taking the very best care possible of these lands for all of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and so on and so forth. Lin Lin. All right, well, I will dive right into my introduction and we will kick things off. So hello and welcome everyone. My name is Victoria Burge and I am welcoming you today as an uninvited guest on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Salix Okanagan people. As the education coordinator of adult programming here at the Kelowna Art Gallery and on behalf of the board of directors and staff, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we operate, gather and benefit every day on the land of the Salix Okanagan Nation. Now tonight we are joined by our guests Claire Fussard and U Apit Kirsted, who are speaking in conjunction with our current exhibition, A Story in Three Parts, Ashivak Hutugu Isuma, curated by William Hoffman. Um, just a little bit about our two speakers before uh, we dive in. Um, Claire Poussard is an American art dealer, curator, and former director of Kai Smith Gallery, Harlem, and East Village in New York. 
Um, since 2017, she has worked with Kinrate Studios and the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative as a research resident and ongoing consultant. Um, U Apik Kirsted is an Inuit artist, activist, and producer born in uh, Frobisher Bay, uh, Northwest Territories, now Iqaluit Nunavut. She is a self-taught artist, host, producer of Inuktitut programming, uh, both in radio and television, and a strong advocate for Inuit culture. So just a few housekeeping rules for those of you who maybe haven't joined us before. Um, please save your questions for the end. There'll be a 15 minute sort of time period for Q&A. Um, at that time, just type your questions into the chat bar below. We'll do our best to get them all answered. And um, it's also important to note that today's lecture is being recorded. So if you know of anyone who would like to check this out at a later date, uh, we'll have it up on our website um, within the coming days. And um, thank you for joining and enjoy the talk. Without further ado, please take it away, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hey. Um, all right, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. <laughs> Um, but yeah, as Victoria said, I'm Claire, um, and Ooh is the one in the fabulous gla glasses. And we're going to speak today a bit about an exhibition that we co-curated this past summer in New York City, and just sort of talk more broadly about the evolving ways in which Inuit artists have used art making as a way to maintain traditional knowledge and share that culture with the world. Um, since the founding of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative and similar cooperatives um, in other Arctic communities, but we're going to focus on the community in Kingite. Um, two artists included in the exhibition at Kelowna, Kinoyuak Ashvak and Sharni Pudaguk, are both from Kingite, um, and we'll speak a little bit about them, um, but we're also going to talk a little bit more about some of the works that were produced by artists in the 1980s up until um, 2021, I think our most recent work was in the exhibition. Um, let's see, share screen, there we go. Uh, does that look right to everyone so far? Yeah. Okay, cool. So Sikusila was the th name of our exhibition and we'll get a little bit more into that as we go along. But first okay. we'll just introduce ourselves a little bit more. Um, there's U and I outside of our exhibition this past summer. It was a very hot day in New York City. <laughs> um, Sikusila is, maybe U, you wanna speak a bit about the game? Okay, well, um... When Claire and I spoke before we decided to do this, um, we talked a bit about some of the restrictions and, and then of course, uh, what she wanted to include in the, in the show. So um, they seem to coincide with uh, the game Sikusila, um, the conversation um, and, you know, I don't know, um, Claire and I kind of always have um, landed on the same wavelength, yeah. if you will. And that time we did when she started talking a bit about uh, how it's a bit, the work is about the landscape and and a bit about the their homes or environment, and and then of course with. COVID restrictions, you know, there was lockdown lifted and then there were restrictions. And so um, Sikusila is a game um, that, you know, uh, popped up for me uh, when we were growing up uh, in gatherings, uh, whether it be Christmas or, you know, the spring festivals. Uh, there would be a line drawn and participants, male or female, would line up on one side and, and the caller uh, would say one side of the line would be Siku 
and the other side would be sila. And every time he said siku, you would jump over or, you know, uh, sila on the other side of the line. And, and then it kind of also uh, paid a homage to uh, Kingite or Cape Dorset, formerly known, um, to their regional um, traditional name of Sikusila. So yeah, that's how we came up with the name. Yeah, so the game sort of seemed like a, a good, like an allegory for the ways in which these artists are like delineating interior versus exterior space. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that as we start talking about some of the works. Um, this is Ooh's hometown of Kim Kimberut. Kimberut, which, yes. Which is a neighboring town. It's just one town over from King Ai. Yes, and most, uh, most of us are related to uh, the people in Kingai as well. So I have close ties with the Suna family. And growing up in Kimilo, you know, that's, that's me there uh, in kindergarten. And that's the community that I grew up in where, you know, um, that's my relatives beside me or some some friends and it was a close knit um, community uh, and we would go carving or um, to the soapstone mining uh, in the same place that the people from Cape Dorset would go. Um, I'm not sure it's functional now, but it was uh, Wakem Bay. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people understand that um, carvers would mine their own soapstone. And that means they need a boat, they need the motor, and a lot of the logistics to be out on the land. Um, so that's also some images from our Greenland trip um, filming the Arctic Defenders. I think it was 2012 that was released in 2013. And that is beautiful Ayu with her aunt. We got to meet her. Um, and, you know, that, that wasn't filmed, but um, that's also a beautiful image of us on board the adventure. Adventurer, I think uh, it was called, uh, a cruise ship that was um, from uh, to the Eastern Arctic. So, yeah. Um, and growing up, uh, my name is U. I'm named after Ualanga. That's who uh, the queen is shaking hands with. Uh, very prominent Inuit um, camp leader, former camp leader. And and then there's an image of us uh, kids with the Prince uh, Felipe of Spain. Uh, he dropped in to Kimilo one Sunday, and you know, uh, it was it was uh, quite uh, a drop in, you know. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, but uh, yeah, some of our childhood friends there as well, and. Um, Maureen Doherty, who is also our girl guide uh, leader, and she helped us uh, start that in, in Kim Mirot. Hi. It's okay. I've been involved in, in the panel there is uh, for I Don't Know More. I think that was 2008, if I'm not mistaken. And I was able to uh, use my friend's flag to uh, show our solidarity from Nunavut. That's a Nunavut flag I'm uh, holding up. And, but um, yeah, I've been um, an advocate for, for a very long time. Um, my father was a carver and I let both my parents were soapstone carvers. Uh, my mom 
was a traditional, um, you know, seamstress and they both um, taught me a lot about art as well. Um, I had to interpret for my dad. So um, that's how I got into kind of the ins and out of, of the, the arts or knowledge of Inuit art, specifically sculptures. But um, yeah, Simeone Akpik was my late father and Hatsao Akpik of Kimirut. But um, I think there's- You some... and I actually met while we, I, we were speaking together on a panel at Art Toronto about Inuit art and this reception of Inuit art in New York City or not in New York City, that's, that's my turf, um, in the wet contemporary art market. Um, and so when we were looking at putting together an exhibition in New York this past summer, I had reached out to U to speak with her, or initially I think just about some getting some work, some words translated because I was struggling with the inducted titles on some work. And the conversation was just so, so productive and we had so many ideas to share um, and, it, I could tell that we were working so much more strongly as a team to develop a sort of curatorial framework for the exhibition. And so who kindly came and joined us for the show um, in July and we got to work with some of the artists currently in Kingite Studios and create a wonderful collection that um, we were very proud of. Um, so maybe I'll go into a bit of the background of about Kingite Studios. Um, so the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative was founded in um, 1958 by a man from Montreal by the name of James Houston. And basically what was intended for this cooperative initiative was to create an infrastructure for the marketing and distribution of Inuit art in the South. Um, so the Inuit community had been uh, relocated into centralized communities around this time, which uh, basically required uh, Inuit to uh, participate in the cash economy in a new way and have to make income. And so since a lot of Inuit had been making carvings or sealskin appliques or different types of crafts that were already sort of popular in southern markets it seemed like a natural um, focus of these cooperatives to develop an actual formalized system of art making um, and so in Kingite um, these are this is an example of some of the artworks that was existing prior to the 1950s so the, on the left you'll see a serpentinite bear carved by Pauta Sela from the mid from the late 1950s and this is sort of what was considered quote unquote traditional Inuit art at the time. And then on the right, you see a, a sealskin purse um, with some sewn appliques. Actually, this purse was made by Kanoyuak Ashivak. And she was carrying the bag um, around the studios that had been set up. Um, by James Houston and his wife and they noticed the applique on the bag and they asked if she wanted to convert, turn it into a print. And so if you look at that symbol on either side of the central square, you might recognize it as rabbit eating seaweed, which is Kanuyuak Ashivak's first ever graphic artwork. And so I, lo I love this story. I didn't even know about it until like this past fall when I was reading the thesis of uh, a budding art historian from Kingai named Nakasak. Alariac, I'll probably mispronounce that, but um, I love the way that this traditional form of art making, this seal, seal skin appliques, has informed the generation of this new kind of imagery with the introduction of printmaking. Um, so James Houston was had studied printmaking in Japan with um, Japanese woodblock printers um, and sort of was inspired by that studio model. Um, but since wood is a sort of uncommon resource in the Arctic as it's above the tree line, they adapted the technique to resources that were available. And as there were so many skilled stone carvers in the community already, they 
decided to start you they invented a type of printmaking called stone cut so you see in this image um this is a printmaker named lukta um and he was one of the first printers that worked with um, the co-op and he's creating the relief uh, matrix for one of Kanoyuak Ashavak's drawings. So the printmaking became sort of an essentially collaborative um, process where the artist would create an image, a drawing, and then work directly with a printmaker to translate that image into a print. So here you see one of Kanoyuak's drawings um, on the left one of her famous owls. And then on the right hand, you see um, the stone cut print adaptation of that. So those color variations and everything would have been chosen by Kanoyuak and the printmaker um, in tandem, as well as some of the art advisors who worked with the WBEC. And this work actually um, eventually was in, on a banknote from Canada that was released when I was um, doing my residency. Um, and so the stone cut printmaking, what has sort of evolved, it originally was carved out of locally sourced stone, but now um, in, a, in an exercise in sustainability, the artists in Kingite are using recycled pool table slate to carve their matrices. So you can see the corner pocket up uh, uh, in this, this slab that actually, I believe this work is included in Kelowna's exhibition. I'm not sure what it's called. Um, but uh, you could, all of these sort of textured marks are hand carved by one of the stone cutters and then the prints are pulled to and released to the South in an annual print collection. Um, so this is a quote by an, an art historian that I think really capsul encapsulates the sort of changing nature of the artwork um, or the role of artwork in Kingite. It says art serves a crucial social function for the Inuit in the second half of the 20th century for by means of, sorry, my, my screen is a little bit covered. Oh, I'm having some technical difficulties. For by means of the arts of printmaking, drawing, sculpture, Inuit people maintain um, a relationship to their unique past to draw harpoons, kayaks, and Inuit syllabics is to be Inuit, where in the past to use these things provided a unique cultural identity. So since this, this art making, this form of art making, graphic arts emer emerged in a time where Inuit were experiencing a lot of cultural upheaval, um, it became a very important tool for visual record keeping and um, maintaining memory that was being threatened um, as the forces of assimilation were kind of um, closing in, um, I guess. And so the, the tradition that emerged is, has created this really essential record of a very changing social and political landscape over the decades. And um, a very unique forms of perspective and in distinctive individual artistic styles started to emerge by the eight by the 1980s. Um, so with Pitsila Kashuna, she was one of the first generation artists working alongside Kanoyuak. And she became known for her sort of intensely autobiographical images. Um, she, Inuit for a long time had, working with the studios had been creating images of the landscape or of Arctic wildlife. Um, but she was one of the first artists to sort of invite you into the home. Um, so this work on the left, I believe is from 1969. And you can see, um, a, it's, I think it's called Summer Tent. And you can see the figures inside the tent. And it's sort of like your first introduction to that interior private life that had yet to be shared with the external art world. Um, and then the, on the, on the right-hand side, we see uh, a 1974 work where you're actually getting like a cross-section view into the tent. And I think this, is been, this was sort of a, a pivotal moment in the graphic arts tradition in Kingite and has informed the way that artists have represented interior private space um, for decades to come. Um, this work by Shutsiak Pudlat was included in our exhibition and you can see again that cross section. Um, I think it's such an interesting 
way to represent that people are inside a space. I think it, in, in some ways it, it speaks to the, the sort of connection with the land um, and that being inside has to be represented by like a separation, a physical separation. And I believe this piece is called Move to Winter Quarters and it, it's a lithograph from the 1984 print collection. And then this is a work by Napachi Pudaguk, who is actually Pitsilakashuna's daughter. And it is continuing that tradition of showing this interior private space, but it becomes a bit more personal. You see, you are, are a little bit closer. You see figures playing with dolls um, and in a, it's, it's sort of Napachi's way of building upon the tradition that she and her mother had created and bringing it into a more modern and contemporary um, landscape. This is another work by Napachi Pudaguk. Um, let's see. So these were two of the works that were sort of the driving um, force behind our curatorial framework. Um, there are two drawings by Jutai Tunu. Uh, for Sikusila, yeah. So I, these were the sort of the first drawings that U and I were speaking about together um, as sort of this pairing juxtaposition of interior life and exterior life. Um, and so the one on the left is called Looking Out My Window and you see the, the development of such a, an almost exacting form of perspective. Jutai started using photography in his work. So he was drawing from images and then these drawings would then be later considered as prints. But he actually, his work um, along with the work of several other artists developed a, a market for drawings themselves outside of the printmaking market which is where you get to see some of the more experimental subject matter, like in this work on the right. Um, I don't know if it, you can see it through your screens, but um, throughout the landscape, there are a cacophony of curse words. Um, and the piece is called Shitty Fucking Windy Day, <laughs> uh, which I think is just hilarious. And again, sort of speaks to uh, a connection to the environment, almost like a, an interpersonal relationship. Well, because on a shitty effing windy day, it's beautiful like that, you know, yeah. when it's clear skies between seasons, it, it does uh, look like that, so. Yeah, it's great. I almost forgot the profanity he wrote. <laughs> yeah, lots of profanity. He, he was he was quite a, and I also like to think of, I mean, with someone like Jutai, who's actually leveraging the written word in his own works, it's sort of extending that tradition of visual record keeping into like a literal record keeping of what was happening in the day, in that day in Jutai's life. Um, this work, um, these are two works by Shubhanaya Shuna, who I'm sure some of the people in the audience know and are familiar with. Um, on the left, I f forget the title, um, Summer Tent. Uh, you, you might have to help me out. Yeah, no, it's, it is the Summer Tent. The Summer Tent. And then on the right is um, a picture of the swarm of bees. Um, and you can see the influence of artists like Pitsilak in this, the representation of a tent from this kind of bird's eye view. And it's this, um, because it, it is, mentorship is sort of inherent to the Kingite community. Like there's people sharing studio space or passing ar artistic methods from generation to generation. It's as, the influence is as literal. You know, isolated to Kingite. This is right. a tradition for Inuit mm -hmm. in any trade. So, just to point that out. Yeah, totally. Um, let's see. What was my what was I going to say about Shubhanak? Oops. Um. So you can see the influence from generation to generation, but you can also see influence between artists of the same generation. And that's one of, this is one of my favorite moments in the collection. 
Um, this is a drawing by um, Padlu Samueli, and the drawing is actually of Chauvenet's uh, station in the drawing studio. So it's on the back of that work, it says, um, Chauvenet's colored pencils. I wonder how many drawings she's colored with them. And you can see just these tiny stubs because Chauvenet has started making these sort of gargantuan six foot fig, um, tall drawings. Wow. I know it's so great. You, I, I found this image um, from my visit to King Eid in 2017 and I was so pleased to see that the pencil, the pencil holder is the same as the one in the drawing. No, like I, when, cause the one on the, the Palu Samoyoli's print was in the Sikusila uh, exhibition. And um, I, I like to point out that, you know, Subunai really cares for her her pencils and, and, you know, sharpens them herself. Mm -hmm. I mean, must be hard to let go. Look, look at how small they are. <laughs> right. And I also, I think it's something that has been so wonderful that I've been able to see since working with this artistic community is, um, I mean, as early as someone like Kanoyu Ashabak, as artists become so celebrated by the market, um, it becomes a real point of pride for the community. Um, and artists sort of take on the role of cultural representatives in a very serious way. And art making um, is a real way for Inuit in communities like King Yate to um, educate the world about their culture and about daily life in the Arctic. Um, these are some other works by um, Pablo Samueli, and so you can see how she's kind of documented the ways in which the landscape has changed. Um, she's no longer depicting a tent or an igloo. She's depicting the buildings that are currently in King Ai. So the two in the middle who um, informed me are gasoline tanks. Yes, the one on the top is actually uh, a tank farm. You could see the other ones kind of in the background. Mm -hmm. And then the one on the bottom is uh, closer to the homes. So that's probably uh, diesel oil to um, for light and, you know, for the home. But um, do you have closer images? You got to see their shadows and their lines. Oh yeah, They're very precise. I may not have one. You, yeah, I don't think I included one in the um, slideshow. But on the upper, um, the blue in, drawing in the center, you can see um, how exactly she has recorded like the changing shadows of. Um, the steps as the sun changes. And so again, it's this sort of like a uh, need to accurately depict what is going on in order to record it and share it with the world. And Padlu began um, creating these sort of like intensely architectural detail drawings. Um, and she caught the attention of the Brooklyn Museum um, in 2015 or 16. And she was invited to go do a to a residency um, and she produced a series of drawings based on photographs that she took while she was here in New York. And so on the right hand side, you see a, a drawing that's in, I believe is titled Pipes in NYC. Um, and I, I think it's so fabulous how uh, she sort of points her style at any site that she sees and it kind of illuminates things that I personally have overlooked in my walk walks about New York City, like I'm sure I've passed by a scene like that a thousand times, but she found a beauty in it and represented it in a really captivating way. And so that was a real privilege to be able to showcase these works um, back in New York City after they had they were went up to the Arctic to be created and then they came back down to uh, New York, which is just the ever ever fascinating movement of art objects. Oh, this image is not as, um, and so we also included image works by um, Padlu's sister, Nikitai Samueli. Um, so this is an installation view from the exhibition. Um, and Nikitai again is sort of representing 
exterior and interior life. Um, I love these two works in particular. Um, she's sort of taken the, the scenes of interior life down to a single object um, of this Clorox container. And she's written down every single thing from the label to make sure that it's exactly the, the right um, the right thing. And then um, on the right hand side is a, a piece called uh, Sometimes They Leave Trash on the Land. So it's an image of the landscape um, with, you can see a Coca-Cola bottle, a Pepsi can, and a box of bullets. And then we also featured some works by an art, a younger artist, Lucy Saila. And Lucy was, um, like many artists in Kingite, she was inspired to create work by watching Kinoyuak Ashavak draw. Um, she was a friend of Kinoyuak's granddaughter, so she would go over to their house to um, play and Kinoyuak would be just drawing, creating works in the corner. Um, and that's, again, mentorship is so essential to the preservation of this type of art making. Um, Lucy, ooh, you, is there anything you want to say about Ooh's works? Lucy's work? Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, they're beautiful. Um, and I could relate. Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, in our DNA and, and when you're exposed to uh, world renowned artists or uh, your family members, um, you know, it just, um, I don't know, we're just uh, sponges and Ulusi does these beautiful, um, cause some of them aren't prints, right? They are originals. Yeah. Yeah, so the one on the left is an original drawing. Um, and then the image on the right is a print, but it's so hard to tell the difference because she knows how to wield a colored pencil like no other. The, the deposit of color on, on the drawings is just so rich that it, there is um, less, less of a translation needed when she's, when she's working with a printmaker. Um, I think a lot of a lot of it is uh, her her work since she is one of the so-called third generation artists. I think her work is influenced by printmaking as a medium. So uh, the mark making is informed by the final print, um, even though it is an original drawing in and of itself. I, I love the one on the right. Um, you know, because that's what it you know, looks like in the spring mm -hmm. when the ice is breaking off and that's a little island. And because we live in tidal uh, areas, the tide comes up and the ice forms around the, the island. And I, um, I think it was Tim, the late Tim Pitsula that would say that looks like a, a cake. Mm -hmm. But. And this is, this is another work by Ulusi, and it, I think we, wow. they, they were referring to it in the studios as the cupcake. Oh, okay. I, I love her work. I, rem I remember being so struck when I visited King Eight um, in 2017, I, when we were sort of descending from the onto the airstrip. The landscape did look almost exactly like her representation of it, even though maybe to someone who has never been to the North would not think that this is that accurate of a depiction of the landscape. Like it beautifully encapsul encapsul like it captures the, the whole scene with the melting snow and um, mm -hmm. yeah, I love this work. Yeah, cause islands are very important uh, for the hunters and families uh, no matter what destination you're going, you will stop and, and either for a rest, uh, you can um, make lunch there or just, you know, um, a little time off the, the rough sea if you, if you need it as well. So yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that U touched on before is, um, 
Sikusila being the traditional place name for the region where Kingite um, is. And one of the conversations that we were having during the conception and ex execution of this exhibition was sort of the way Inuit place names in a way similar to art, um, sort of preserve and pass along cultural knowledge that is essential. Um, so Ooh, if you wanna speak more a bit about that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the Canadian Arctic map now, it's like King whoever and, you know, all these Europeans, um, but um, we do have traditional place names and a lot of them are descriptive. They can also warn you of danger. Um, and that goes with also the Inukshuks. Um, some of them might help you to navigate through charters like around islands because you don't want your boat to, you know, hit uh, the bottom or as they say, landed, I think. Um, so, um, but traditional place names are, are very um, strong for the hunters, particularly. Um, and, you know, there's traditional fishing camps. Um, they might have names, including where they might get some eider ducks or, uh, eggs, you know, when they're egg hunting uh, over the spring, usually um, during the melt. Um, yeah, so it's, we're very descriptive, even for our nicknames, um, you know, for, because we couldn't um, say the white guys, Hudson's Bay clerk's name or um, so there were a lot of nicknames as well that kind of describe the character of, of the person they've, yeah, they've named. <laughs> but that's um, Yeah, so we can speak a bit about sculpture as well. Um, we included a number of sculptural, sculptural works in the collection. Um, there's sort of, there's less of a continuity in imagery in some of the sculptural works, but I think something that's important to note is um, that the scale of most of these sculptures um, is so large, like basketball sized or more, which is something, which is something that was developed distinctly for an external art market. Um, since Inuit were formerly nomadic, um, a lot of the carving done previously was something that would be easily transportable, something smaller. Um, but there's been a really strong market for these sculptures in the South and around the world since as early as the arrival of whalers and before. Um, so these works are by an artist named Puduguk Ja, and he's one of the master carvers in Kingite. Um, he's taken on a mentorship role and um, is really strongly trying to maintain this tradition in younger generations. Um, so on the left, you see a series of drum dancers and on the right, you see um, a piece called Eve and the Tree of Knowledge, um, where Pudu has decided to d show Eve wearing an amauti, um, sort of reclaiming the Judeo-Christian narrative as his own in a way. And I mean, the picture doesn't do its justice oh, as I know. far as the size. And I mean, the balance of where she is and that big- Yeah, uh, it's-, it's you know, really Earth, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, that piece is quite remarkable. It was carved from a single block of stone. So when we showed that piece in um, in New York City, I can promise you that all of the sculptors that we work with <laughs> at the gallery who are based in New York could not believe their eyes and were insanely jealous. And everyone sort of kept looking around it and saying, how is it not tipping over? How is it not tipping over? Um, but 
this balance um, and creating these works that are kind of like defying physics almost is also a hallmark of Inuit sculpture as of late. Yeah, my, my family are sculptors or carvers, we would say. Mm -hmm. And um, Mealy actually, uh, whom I had the pleasure of interviewing, she would say she, that, you know, cause I would ask like, do you already know what it's going to be? And she, she said she would chip away and, and it's like a present, you know, at the end, it, kind of speaks for itself. You just start to realize what it's becoming as you're chipping away. It's a, a collaboration with um, the earth in a way. A lot yeah, of, I speaks about um, that, his practice in a similar way, saying that what he chooses to make um, is almost dictated by the piece of stone that he's working with because the stone itself has been created by millions of years and of pressure and glacier movement and everything. And it has these cleavage marks and different pieces are different levels of hardness. So it's just a real, these artists have an amazing mastery of geology as well. Um, and you can see again in this piece by James E. Pitsilak, the one on the left, that is sort of a raw edge um, of the stone. So he's sort of highlighting the material as a sort of central um, theme here. And that's a piece called Missing Link. Um, and then on the right, we have a wonderful sculpture this photo again doesn't do it justice, but it's called uh, Not a Victorian, which is hilarious. The sense of humor on that guy is <laughs> knows no bounds. Um, and so those are two of some of the more um, established sculpture, sculptors, carvers that were um, included in the exhibition, but we also featured some of the um, rising talent. Um, Ningyu Shuakashuna, um, she was born in the 70s, but she was raised by her grandparents um, out on the land in a very traditional way. Um, and, I th and she speaks about her work being um, heavily influenced by her upbringing that was sort of uncharacteristic of most Inuit living in the North at that time. Her family was the last family to um, settle in Kingite in 1996. So wow. I know, right? Because um, there's some myths as well, or legends that we were one with the animal. And so there's a morph, you know, in a lot of, uh, there's the loon on this one and the seal um, and the rabbit on, as well. Um, and I saw that in, Tukumi, Robert Tukumi and Baker Lake's um, prints and, and artwork as well, where they depict um, the animal, one with the- Right, the, these transformation scenes. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. But yeah, there's serpentine, right? Serpentinite mm -hmm. or something, I'm sorry. And marble Serpent in the middle, which is really hard. Um, from what my brothers would tell me, it's, it's really hard to carve. Um, and um, then there's the, the, the darker the dark serpentinite. serpentinite. Right, so the green and black are both the same stone. There's just that much variation in um, what's getting quarried. And so yeah. sometimes um, for a period of a time, a lot of the work will come from one section of the quarry. So it'll be very green. And then maybe a few months later that all of that stone will be used up and they'll move to a different section of the quarry that is more of this black stone. So again, nature uh, influencing the artwork as much as it can. Um, and then we also had some images of some more contemporary quote unquote subject matter. Um, these are works by an artist named Pitsilak Kamirpik. And so on the left, we have Homer getting mail. And then on the right, we have Marge walking her pet muskox, um, which these figures are 
were very popular uh, in our exhibition. Um, and uh, it's sort of a prime example of the ways in which Pitsilak, um combines tradition and pop culture in each of his work. Um, he's known for uh, creating images of dancing bears or dancing Arctic wildlife listening to iPods. Um, so he's a real uh, up and coming talent um, that we were delighted to feature. And I believe these, these works ended up in the collection of one of the writers for The Simpsons, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, well, there was talk of giving one or the other, you know, yeah. I wasn't sure if he was going to end up with the whole set, but uh, a friend of a friend, right. the, the one of the writers. Yeah, cute, eh? Which is such a testament to the, the way that art or objects can move throughout the world in a way that maybe people don't. Um, and so to have this image be created in Kingite, um, inspired by a TV show from the US, um, and then the work makes its way to an exhibition in New York City and then finds its way back to um, one of the show's creators. I think that speaks to sort of the power of this kind of art as a form of cultural exchange and um, self-representation and just, I, I think it's just spectacular. <laughs> and I think that's the end of my images. So I think we can open up to some questions if people have anything. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Claire, and thank you, Ooh. That was amazing. It's so, so great to be able to see the these up and coming Inuit artists what they're doing and um, I think especially for a lot of Canadians in the southern provinces for us to realize that it's not you know the the art form isn't stuck in the past it's very much today and modern and happening and that's sort of what the exhibition here the Kelowna Art Gallery is doing we've got the past the present the future all sort of under one roof um, so yeah thank, thank you so much for for letting us explore your exhibition and, and letting us learn a little bit more about both of you. Um, so yeah, we'll open it up to questions. So if anybody in the audience has any questions, type them into the chat bar. Um, I think we have a comment here from Sandra. She says, I love all the stories about the people and materials and the landscape. Um, any more stories that you would like to share would be appreciated. Anything else you would like to add, Claire or Ooh? Well, Claire, what was it like when you went to King A all the way from New York? I mean, how did that, how, how did you connect with King A art or Inuit art in general? Well, I first, I first encountered Inuit art when I was actually, I come from an art history background. Um, I studied art history and anthropology in undergrad and I was um, interning at, uh, an, an art gallery in Chelsea when I actually met William Huffman um, who curated the exhibition at Kelowna. And I was sort of um, experiencing some gallery internship burnout, uh, a little bit of dissatisfaction with the contemporary art world and a lot of the ego that goes along with it. And so I met William and he started sharing with me about the artists in Kingite. And I looked at some of the images and I was just so struck by how vibrant they were and how unique some of the forms of representation were. And so the following year, we did, I um, got funding to do a research residency. Um, and I was mo primarily in Toronto, but I did get to go up to Kingite to work with some of the artists. And it's quite um, interesting. I mean, I'm from Minnesota, so I think of myself as a northerner. Um, <laughs> Um, but when I arrived there, I just had never seen a landscape quite like it. I, you can't really underestimate. Um, I love the landscape. What, it, what yeah. it's like yeah. to, to not have trees. If you come from a place where there are trees, it is a very different feel if you're in a place where trees are not growing. Um, and 
I just have learned, I have learned so much. I've spoken with, I was able to speak with many of the artists whose work we spoke about. Um, and it's just completely transformed the way I think about art and the way I think about artists. And it has so greatly informed the way that I work with artists based in New York City. Um, and just how I think about the art world in general. I mean, I, this work has been, Inuit art has sort of seen many chapters of scrutiny and rejection from the art market, um, but first it was sort of relegated to an area of ethnography and then it was sort of rejected because it was created for commercial purposes as though art in the in the U.S. is not created for the sale. Um, and then now to see these artists be celebrated like Shubhanaya Shuna, she's going to be featured in this year's Venice Biennale in the Central Exhibition. And so I've just been able to see these artists be accepted for the creators that they are and not the creators that maybe the art market wants them to be, um, which has been a really amazing experience to be a part of. Yeah, no, but the King <laughs> landscape is very sexy. It and is very sexy. <laughs> there's, there's one landscape where the lady looks like she's lying down and facing away and there's a mm -hmm. silhouette of her and um, they have uh, Muluya Mountain. <laughs> Yes, there's a there's a mountain in this. Kingite means mountain, um, but uh, it is sort of cheekily referred to as Nipple Mountain because it <laughs> sort of looks like a breast, um, which I just think is so funny. Uh, one of my think, favorite things. You know, that goes back to the descriptive right, uh, exactly. naming of of you know a place or or even a a, a hill or a, a mountain like that. But sorry, I interrupted. Um, no, it's okay. Let's see. Let's look at some of these other questions. Yeah. Um, so we have another one here from Eric. Um, more of a practical question. So just asking, is the ink or color for the prints all applied to one single stone cut? Or is there multiple stone cuts per print that are then overlaid? So basically, the stone cut ca carving is magic. It's magic. <laughs> Um, it, we can't reveal our, their secrets. Um, okay. so it's, a, it's a stone. It's a stone slab, and then ink is applied. Um, not not single color. They'll be uh, they'll apply all of the colors to a single block, and then lay the the print down and pull the pull the paper off, and then reapply ink and do that about fifty times to create the full edition. I'm sure wow. if you look it up on YouTube, Eric, uh, there might be some images of them using the rollers and, and... Absolutely. Yeah, there's some really good content on YouTube. Or just Google. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't cut prints from King Knight or Cape Dorset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. And Thank after, you. After, after the print is pulled, Typically the stone is ground down. So that beautiful relief carving is actually destroyed. And then the block is used again um, for the next round. Yes, I remember, <laughs> I, re I remember William telling me that here um, when he was giving us a tour of the exhibition and it's like, oh my God, all of that work. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Um, so we have lots of thank yous coming in. Um, one other inquiry here from Wayne. Um, he says, I have a wall hanging from Baker Lake and just wondering how I could show it to you and get your opinion. Um, so maybe maybe we'll share some details afterwards um, mm -hmm. to get yeah, that to you. Share my contact info. Sure, yes. Baker Lake yeah, is known for their wall hangings, uh, it's textiles, and um, Una is one of the well-known artists from Baker Lake, I believe, mm -hmm. um, just off the top of my head. But um, yeah. Excellent. Um, I had a question. Um, this might, might be a really dumb question, but um, I was just curious, uh, 
about how certain art for or certain art mediums seem to have caught on in popularity more so than others. Um, obviously, drawing is very popular, and printmaking, of course, has stemmed from that. Um, but I know, ooh, you do some wonderful acrylic paintings, and I was just curious if painting caught on or if there's a reason why maybe it's not as popular. I think there might be some Jutai Tunu mm -hmm. paintings out there as well, but thank you. Um, I'm an amateur, self-taught. Um, I think it just was my yearning to reconnect with my culture when I moved here. So I started kind of dabbling with, with acrylic medium and I learned really fast that um, canvas variate, or there's variations of canvas quality. Um, but um, what, what um, really inspired me, and people laugh at this a lot, but Bob Ross and I were like this <laughs> when I was in Winnipeg for Arctic Defenders. And um, I started to really notice some of his techniques, you know, you, even some of your mistakes, beautiful mistakes. <laughs> the accidents. <laughs> the accidents, yes. They're not accidents, they're beautiful, beautiful mistakes. <laughs> But, um, and so I, I did a lot of the uluit. Um, it, it was kind of like a collage to help me to understand my brushes, really, and, um, and depth. Um, so I played around with uh, the, the woman's knife and, and all different shapes. And, and you know, because women were in different shapes. And so... Yeah, there, there's one piece that, that's uh, up in Naomi Wellman's beautiful home in Ikhaluit um, that is actually quite massive. Um, I think it was 40 by 20 in, in gallery canvas. And it took me a while, but she was very patient. Um, and yeah, those are different styles of uluit that and some imaginary uh, at the time, um, but the styles in Ulu making have actually evolved to some of what those, um, what I've depicted actually. So yeah, I, I like to think that um, I helped influence that <laughs> uh, when, I would, when I was at the, um, so I started trying to sell my art at like um, uh, the April Tunic Time Festival in Nihaluit, and um, one of the one of the guys asked because they're they're not all traditional looking Uluit pieces that that I depict in in my art. Uh, he asked me, you know, what what Ulu is that one used or what kind of skin is it for and I was like I don't know and um you know with the long handle there I didn't know at the time and then when I saw him again I waved him down and I said I think you could use it for scraping some of the dry skin like the western arctic maybe <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah. There's painting there's some, been some painting in um in King, I, like we mentioned, Ju Tai Tunu started working with some acrylics back in the day. Um, but I mean, there's been a number. Hmm? What about Tim Pizzula? Tim Pizzula was, did he do much painting? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. But I think, I think for the most part, printmaking sort of took off in places like King Ike because there was a willingness on behalf of like the printmakers. Um, they were really interested in, enjoyed the actual medium. I mean, printmaking was also introduced to communities like Baker Lake, but um, they were sort of less interested and they were more interested in creating uh, textile wall hangings like the one that Wayne mentioned. Um, but there's to ongoing artist workshops that happen up in the North all the time. I know, um, in Kingite, there was an animation workshop in the late 
in the 80s maybe um where that several of the artists participated in so a lot of artists created either like stop motion or different types of animation so it's just uh, constantly there's new forms and artists are creating new types of work out of the materials that they have on hand i know once one carver i'm forgetting the name but uh she created a sculpture out of styrofoam um and like she carved a whole piece out of styrofoam but i i think it just ended up sitting in the studio because the sort of studio managers thought you know this is not something that people can understand as inuit art um which has been a real difficulty for a lot of artists can I get a hold of it and make a mold yeah exactly <laughs> Um, but Sandra Kettler mentioned descriptive names of places, landmarks. Thank you for sharing. I want to point out that there's even an app. I yeah, the it, app is fabulous. I, I think it's called Siku. It's S -I -K called Siku, yeah. that you can download. And there's a bunch of traditional place names around the Baffin specifically right now using that mm -hmm. app. Siku, and if you point at the area and the place name, it gives you the English uh, version of, of why it's called that. So mm -hmm. that's very, yeah, look it up. Have fun that's with incredible. it. Yeah, I will. Yeah. And maybe if that you get to so go cool. to Nunavut, you could show off your, some of your knowledge in the region, Sandra. Just kidding. <laughs> Ilali, you're welcome. Yeah, that app is wonderful. There's so many initiatives um, that are so productive in preserving this cultural knowledge. I think U was telling me that a lot of the land claims um, agreements that have happened since the 90s have included um, restoration of traditional place names, um, mm -hmm. which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, well, like Kingai, uh, it was formerly Cape Dorset, uh, Kimmerut, where I'm from, and that's it, oh, right behind me, um, it was formerly Lake Harbor, and our capital in Nunavut was Frobisher Bay initially, and uh, now it's called the Khaluit, and so there's a lot of communities that have, um, decided to yeah use their traditional place names so it's a great way to revitalize culture and respect um and that's uh some of the initiatives that have started because of the land claims and yeah but you know it's uh also community, you know, it, it was up to King Knight or Cape Dorset at the time to um, become King Knight, you know? Yeah, I believe they voted between Cape Dorset, <laughs> King Knight and Siku Sila. Yes. Yeah, I wondered um, why they didn't go with the Siku Sila. Yeah, I don't know, maybe just because of the, the location of the town being so close to the mountain. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. Well, um, I mean, I think there's there's probably still a long way to go, but it's it's hopeful to see that there's there's some resurrection and traditional language and culture and and revitalization and hopefully it happens faster. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I well, think and that... art, you know, art plays a big role for for historic uh, knowledge, culture, and and tradition. And and I'm very proud of Kingait art and Inuit art in general uh, that continue to contribute to um, our geographical or cultural. Uh, knowledge in 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 their yeah in their art. Hey. Absolutely. 
Well, um, I think we're nearing the end of our time together and I think we've answered everyone's questions. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much, Ooh and Claire for joining us here in Kelowna. <laughs> um, it was happy. a pleasure hosting you. Uh, at, is there anything that you'd like to say in closing before we sign off? Uh, Ilali, that means you're welcome. Thank you very much for uh, including me in this uh, panel. Thank you, Claire. Nice to see you. Uh, we met in Toronto Art um, with uh, William. So um, it's maybe, always such a pleasure to see you. Maybe you should come back up to Canada I think so. soon. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think it's I'm your turn. Yeah, it was great. Um, I, I forgot to talk a bit about my experience coming to New York. Uh, it was my first time to go to the States. Uh, thank you so much for hosting me when I was there. Uh, it was like 300 degrees every day, but I managed to keep it cool, you know, Eskimo and all. <laughs> um, no, I found a little a mini portable air conditioner that said air <laughs> on it that we had. I hugged it the whole time, <laughs> um, but it was quite an eye-opener even for me um, as far as presenting uh, the, the curatorial work that was there in New York, and um, I think there was an Instagram um, posted, but I'm pretty sure it's outdated now, you know, like if that's how it is today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was yesterday, like three months ago. Just yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but thank you, Victoria and Kelowna Art Gallery, William. I'm sure um, we'll chat soon. And yeah, have a quick visit soon, Claire. I'll be there as soon as I can. Okay. All right, well, thank you both for joining us. Um, quickly before we go, I'd like to say that um, we, of course, want to thank our sponsor, Benson Law, for their generous support of our um, uh, presentation of a story in three parts here at the Kona Art Gallery. And um, stay tuned, there will be another lecture happening in conjunction with a story in three parts. Um, and we hope to see you all there. And if you're in or around Kelowna, please take some time to come down and visit. Um, always happy to, to see new visitors coming in through the doors. Okay, so that, that's everything for me. And I wish you all well. And thank you again. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Bye.